Yeah, we are here in uh, the Art Directors Club in New York City and um, uh, just had Stefan Sackmeister, one of the world's most famous designers, um, given a lecture about design and happiness. Um, and you really affected and inspired um, the class. Well, I mean, uh, when, when I look at, at your work, there is, I mean, something really comes up visually. It feels like handmade in a world where it seems that mass, the mass aspect of business, of com commerce, of things, of advertising is sort of imploding. And here you have almost like a grandma wrote down the best recipe mm -hmm. for a cake and, and gave it to, to, to her daughter. Or, 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 or so so the, the hand craft and the, the, uh, the hand made comes somewhere out of it. Is, 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 that, is that a thought of you? <coughs> is, is that a concept? Or yeah, Did I mean, it just happen no, I think we, uh, I realized when talking to people that are not designers, that are, you know, talking to my mom, talking to uh, people totally outside of our world, that they often were surprised how much work and attention would go, in some, would go into something that they thought was done by a machine. You know, let's say, if, uh, I talk to my mom about a newspaper. She would know that there's a journalist behind it who wrote that article, but she wouldn't know that the newspaper itself, the way the from the the logo of the the paper to all the way down to the layout to the single decisions on the kerning of the type, was actually done by people, and that put a lot of uh, work in there. I think that. Some of this clearly comes out of, you know, the uh, ongoing strengths of modernism. We, of course, modernism, when it came in the 20s, very much wanted to design a machine-like culture for the new age, for, you know, uh, to take the individual out mm. of not yeah. just communications, yeah. but also out of architecture and yeah. products. And this, of course, was necessary at the time to get rid of all that frivolous, you know, ornament and borders that seemed antiquated uh, after the Industrial Revolution. But we've had that cold machine-like style now basically for 80 years. And it, well, it's been around for so long that people believe that, yes, all this stuff was actually made by a machine. There wasn't really somebody behind that. And I think so much of it uh, part with overuse, part because it always wanted to be cold, just uh, so much of it works well in meetings where you know you can look at a piece of communication and you can say yes it does this, yes it does this, yes it does this, yes it does this, but nobody in the outside world actually even gives it a look. Uh, so of course it does none of these things it only does them when you actually go through the trouble to check if it does it. Uh, so there was a definitely desire to fight that and uh, I felt subjectivity to get rid of this idea or to circumvent this idea that everything has to be seen from an objective point of view where you take the individual out where it's all just about uh, you know, form follows function where you actually bring an individual voice back in uh, and while it creates humanity yeah. 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 and it works in a surprisingly wide area you know like in the beginning I thought okay maybe this works for communication pieces that need to be emotional but let's say even if I go to the most dry and important pieces of communication let's say the, the little card in the airline seat that tells you what to do when evacuating. Uh, all airlines always did this in the most modernist manner using icons developed in between 30 and 80 years ago 
by Otto Neurath or Otto Leicher in Germany um, because they thought this is the way to do this, this is the proper way to do this. It turns out that when Virgin made them much more cartoony and much warmer, it was the first time ever that I saw people actually studying these things, including the little film. So there, if you compare the two, yes, it might be the case that the more emotional one might take five seconds longer to understand than the totally clear one. But considering that you could increase the viewership of it by a magnitude, those five seconds longer are well worthwhile. And I think that's, uh, that's true for many, many pieces of communication. Well, I'm uh, extremely impressed by your Casa de Musica uh, design, yeah, because you really honor uh, the architect. But, yeah, and we will, if you allow that, we will show it on mm -hmm. our website so people can see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, talk a little bit how you found that. I mean, you struggled in the first mm -hmm. place because uh, uh, you were asked to produce mm -hmm. a logo for, for this institution. Uh, and then, finally, you knew what you had to do. Well, there were a couple of things. Uh, one was, and I mentioned it in the talk, the, uh, this sentence by Ren Kohlhaas that basically said that the, the big building, the actual building, is a logo. I think that made things easier. Then uh, the, the president of Casa de Musica had in one of the numerous meetings I had with him talked about the building as a dice where you know you can throw it and it, yeah. it uh, winds up on a different facet. They actually at one time right at the opening had a tagline which uh, I thought was a good tagline. I just am not a big fan of taglines for cultural buildings. Uh, because to me, they always seem a bit like... What was the tagline? Uh, one house, many musics. Which I thought was great. But I always felt, and, well, and it was true. Anybody could use it. It's one no. house, many musics. Yeah. In a way, it's not unique. It's not unique. But it, at least it was true, because they really had a very successful, very diversified program. What I didn't like about, what I didn't like about it was that, yes, it wasn't very unique, and second, uh, at least as important, that to me, when you have to say it, you are not it. You know, you should show things rather than have to spell them out. And so I would think that these three things, that the uniqueness of the program, and the uniqueness of the audiences, because they really, they had so many different audiences. You know, the ravers wouldn't show up for the reggae, the reggae guys wouldn't show up for the pop stuff. The pop guys, of course, would never even enter when the classical music was going on. Even in things that you would think, let's say, like the, the, uh, the contemporary classical audience was totally different than the classical audience no overlap whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it was all these different things to different people and there was definitely a desire to sort of to honor that conceptually, to be able to and still bind it of course all tightly together because at the same time all these people would go to the same building. And I think at the time we had uh, this uh, entire idea that you could do that you could involve computer programming into the design process was still quite new and interesting. Uh, and, I mean, you know, a good number of other influences. I always thought that sameness in branding can be very effectful for a certain kind of client. You know, if you use your brand as a stamp of approval, you probably want a stamp of approval kind of brand that stays the same, that is the, yeah. that's how we send it off. Yeah. But there's many, many clients out there where uh, a changing brand is much more effectful. And I, I always felt and, uh, that the idea of sameness was much overrated in branding. 
in, in many ways. You know, if I look at subway systems, this stupid idea that every subway station along a line has to have the same color and look the same yeah. is not only inhuman, it, it goes against human well, nature. There are, there are nice solutions. There are some fantastic solutions. I mean, okay. Moscow has a, has a fantastic yeah, one, I mean, yeah. where they gave every station to a different architect. And it's lovely and it's extremely practical. Well, yeah. focus is actually uh, key when, when, when we want to do effective work, let's say that. Uh, and it seems that your focus, if, if I interpre interpret it right, is a one-word strategy maybe happiness in design and um, almost like magic for Disney or say for Volvo. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, now if that's the case, are you looking to make yourself happy? Are you looking to make the people happy? Do you want to do both at the same time? And do you source this happiness out of human insights that you discover in yourself? My guess would be that so much of what I, what I do so far that ultimately has an increase of well-being in mind takes curious detours into getting there. You know, even if I just, let's say, the situation in New York, I live 10, or 10 minutes uh, from my office, I probably pass a dozen gyms just in, those, in that 10 minute walk, all of them full. And I would think that many of those people in the gyms do it for some way or another to cre increase the happiness either be fitter, either be have a better body to increase to increase chances with a better partner, what not. And I w I'm wondering if there isn't a way to do this more directly. That I'm completely convinced that there is uh, much evidence out there that you can actually train the mind. Uh, so why not train the mind at the same time as training the body to reach some stuff more directly. Yeah. And that's uh, I'd, uh, I would want to try out to see if that is possible. Yeah. So that makes me very happy that we have you here and you give us your wisdom and your time. And um, I know that um, we will see a lot of other things coming from you. I can't wait to have you here again. Thanks so much. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.